Hiya, I'm Tom Franklin Payne and I'm Rory and Atty Green's uncle. I'm also a specialist nurse. I'm reading chapter 18 of Woof. Eric had no real plan in mind except to put himself between Emily and the Mastiff. It was the same one he'd had trouble with before from Stone Street. However, the moment he did this, events moved rapidly and carried him along. The Mastiff, though, caught off guard, took a step forward and snarled. Eric stood his ground. Roy clutched his bag and looked for something to throw. Eric felt the fur rising along his back. For a second, he thought he was changing again. A growl developed in his throat. Emily said, Two dogs! Roy said, See him off, Eric! Eric said, Woof! Whereupon, unbelievably, the Mastiff gave a sudden terror-stricken howl, turned tail, cleared the back fence with a tremendous jump and disappeared. In the silence which followed, Eric could hear the distant clatter of teacups, the sharp bang of the starter's pistol, the crowd cheering. He felt greatly puzzled but elated too. He had to check himself from advancing on the fence and barking through it. Roy's first thought was that Eric must have said something to the Mastiff. He still believed that Eric could communicate with other dogs. He was also, of course, bowled over with admiration. However, his final theory, developed later, was that the Mastiff may have sensed, by smell for instance, or a foreign accent in Eric's barking, that there was no ordinary dog. Here was a zombie dog, perhaps, or a vampire dog, a body snatcher dog. That would be enough to scare a Doberman Pinscher, even. Emily, meanwhile, was unperturbed. Having seen one dog depart, she simply transferred her interest, not to say affection, to the next. This one was more her size anyway. Roy said, did you see that bit of chain hanging from his collar? He's broken loose, I bet. Woof, said Eric. Over her shoulder and with all her attention fixed on Eric, Emily said, hello, Roy. She crouched and patted Eric on the head. He, for his part, felt a sudden urge to lick his his little sister's face and did so. She tasted like makeup, her red Bo Peep cheeks and banana yoghurt. Emily was charmed. She kissed him back on the nose and peered closely into his eyes. Into his face, sorry. Nice dog, she said. And then, Eric? Eric's not here, said Roy, intervening sharply. He had the uncomfortable feeling that Emily was onto something. Come on, let's have an ice cream and find your mum. Roy certainly had a way with small children. He understood them too. As the usual mention of ice cream showed, Emily was hooked. Or lolly, she said. So Roy took Emily's hand and led her via the refreshment area where lollies and ice cream were also sold to the announcer's table. Eric followed at a distance. He wasn't keen to meet his mum. Emily, though, intent on her lolly, kept swivelling round to see if he was there. Then Mr Hodge made an announcement, saying Emily was safe and sound. Shortly after, a hot and flustered Mrs Banks came rushing up. She was out of breath and encumbered with a homemade shepherd crook. Oh, Emily, where have you been? Did you find her, Roy? You are good. Where's Eric? Mrs Banks gave Emily a cuddle and telling off. He's uh, still looking. We split up, said Roy. I only left her for a minute, said Mrs Banks, turning uh, uh, to Mr Hodge. Two dogs, said Emily. Little Bo Peep lost herself, said Mr Hodge. A big dog and a little dog, Emily said. Then, even more hot and flustered and encumbered by a homemade sheep on wheels, Emily's gran came running up, rushing up, sorry. Oh, Emily. Mr Hodge offered his chair and Gratefully, Emily's gran sat down. She fanned herself with a programme. Look at her, she said, nodding at Emily. She's not bothered. Emily remained engrossed in her lolly. A big dog and a little dog, she said. Yes, dear, said her gran. And Emily said, I want one. Now Emily's gran spotted Roy. 
He was trying to sneak off. Hello, Roy. Where's Eric? I only left her for a minute, uh, said Mrs. Banks. And then, yes, where is Eric? Can't face me. Oh, but I'll find him for you, said Roy, continuing to back away. Tell him I'd like a word, said Mrs. Banks. Right, said Roy. And Roy, yes. One more thing. What's Eric wearing? Wearing? Yes, as far as I can tell, he's running round with nothing on. Then Roy experienced the guilty feeling he sometimes had with his own mum, made worse on this occasion by the fact that he himself was innocent. Wearing? I can't remember. At which point, out of range of further questioning, he turned and fled. Eric had watched all this and heard most of it. From his hiding place a short way off, under the tombola table, his mother's comment reminded him, if he needed reminding, of the trouble he was in and the risks he ran. He had another, more urgent problem too, thirst. He was panting so hard he sounded like a piece of wood being sawn up. As Roy went by, Eric slipped out of the and followed him. After they had gone a few yards, Roy stopped and bent down. You did great, Eric, he said. Hey, you're looking thirsty. Get me a drink, then, thought Eric. You want a drink? Woof. Right, said Roy. Let's see what we can do. He turned once more in the direction of the refreshment area. Perhaps we can find a saucer or something. Meanwhile, out on the track, Mr Moody, using twice the words he was accustomed to use, was starting the race. Ready, steady, he held the pistol aloft, bang! Elsewhere, Hopper, watched by most of the large Hopper family, was behaving himself in the high jump. Mr Hodge was making an announcement about the boys' brigade band. Overhead, a few clouds had gathered and a plane was flying by. Eric and Roy had almost reached the refreshment area when suddenly Eric felt a wobbly sensation in his legs. He remembered the last time this had happened in Roy's room just before... Oh no! He remembered reading about dogs and earthquakes. They often ran away minutes before it happened. They knew it was coming. He knew it was coming. I'm changing back. Desperately, there were people everywhere. Eric looked for a place to hide. He felt like Cinderella at 12 o'clock. He'd never make it to the long grass, that was for sure. Then, up ahead, he caught sight of the Punch and Judy tent. It was still unattended, though a scattering of hopeful infants sat waiting for the show. That'll do, he thought, and thereafter instantly shot past Roy like a whippet, burrowed frantically at the um, back of the tent, wriggled under and disappeared. Roy's first reaction, having witnessed this, was to hope no one else had. When he was sure they hadn't, he casually approached the tent, bent down and pretended to search in his bag. Eric, come out of there. Roy spoke from the side of his mouth in his usual classroom manner. There was no reply. He said, anyway, what's it like? Forgetting that Eric couldn't tell him. I've always wondered. What it was like, of course, was the inside of a tall, brightly coloured tent. The little curtain at the top where the puppets appeared was drawn. The light was green and turquoise and red, where the sun shone through the canvas material the puppets themselves dangling upside down from a row of hooks on a piece of wood, waist high at the front of the tent. There was a small wooden box for the puppeteer to stand on. Eric, however, was in the condition, was in no condition to notice any of this or tell Roy about it. He was otherwise engaged in changing back into a boy. Also, his eyes were shut. Roy, meanwhile, was becoming impatient. Come on, Eric, I thought you were thirsty. And suspicious too. What are you doing in there? Still, there was no answer. Roy shuffled sideways and put his ear to the tent. Nothing. 
that just as he was wondering what else to do, a hand appeared under the bottom edge of, and a voice, Eric said, Lend me your kit, boy. Thank you.